Outsource Your MVP. Written by Matt Kelly. Narrated by Jessica Geffen. Chapter 1. Let's do it. Welcome. If you've reached this far, I'll go out on a limb and assume that it's quite likely I can sum you up in one line. You have some great ideas and you're ready to execute. Was I right? You should only continue if you've made the decision to take action on getting your project live and you're ready to go about building out your project in an exciting, rewarding, and sometimes even challenging way. Outsourcing digitally is a powerful and exciting way of complementing your current skill set to assist in the build phase of a project. Popular applications of digital outsourcing include designing and developing a website, building a blog, creating a mobile application, copywriting, utilizing a virtual assistant to deal with your administrative tasks, proofreading, modernizing or refreshing your website, adding mobile capability to your business's website, creating a piece of software, wireframing or conceptualizing a new online page, new product design, graphical mock-ups, and many more. After listening to this audiobook, I hope that you'll know all the basics required to outsource your project to an expert when you need a hand. The MVP When this audiobook was first published, it was titled The Entrepreneur's Guide to Outsourcing with Confidence. As you might expect upon writing the first edition, I had the thousands of business owners in mind who've built a company and need help scaling quickly. The truth is, I'm incredibly passionate about the startup industry. I enjoy nothing more than studying the development of new tech companies, assessing market value, watching ideas turn into platforms used by millions of people, and occasionally even seeing the big exit for millions or billions of dollars. Historically, and by historically, we're really just talking about the past few years, you had to be an engineer, a designer, or a developer to build out a tech startup. While that's still a common belief, the reality is I've built dozens of web platforms, including a couple of fairly complex projects, as a non-technical founder, not a web developer, with outsourced partners as my technology arm. So while most assume that outsourcing becomes valuable when you've built your product or website and you need help replicating or systemizing processes, I've had a contrary experience. I primarily outsource when in the very early stages of a startup to validate an idea with a customer base before investing thousands of dollars and hours into building. This is the process of the minimum viable product, commonly referred to as an MVP. The minimum viable product is a term that was coined by Steve Blank and Eric Ries, longtime influencers in the tech industry. By modern definitions, your MVP is essentially a minimal, stripped-back version of your product that can be built quickly and put in the hands of your customers, which then enables you to assess whether you're truly solving a problem. If this early version of your product's core feature set proves your hypothesis correct, you can build out a fuller, more comprehensive version of your product with the confidence of knowing that you're solving a problem for your customers. This goes against the trend of the past, where businesses would invest thousands, even millions of dollars to build a company behind closed doors without ever really knowing whether their solution is right for their market, until it's too late, of course. By building an MVP, you're essentially taking your big vision, stripping it back, and building out the least amount of technology required to validate your thinking. This ultimately accelerates learning, reduces time and money, gets the product to customers quickly to validate market need. Activity Use a blank piece of paper to draw, sketch, or list the elements within your fully featured product and then cross out all of the supplementary or non-core features. This will help you to determine what needs to be included in your MVP and will form the basis of your initial hypothesis. How'd you do? If you included nice-to-have features in your MVP, strip it back further. 
The core purpose of your MVP is to validate market need, nothing more. Outsourcing defined. In simple terms, outsourcing is the delegation of tasks to a third party. Theoretically, you can outsource work anywhere – to family, friends, a neighborhood small business, a digital agency, or even a large organization. The Internet has bridged the gap for outsourcing work internationally. However, because the cost of living is significantly lower in some countries than others, it is often entirely possible to get work done by highly skilled individuals for a fraction of the price you might pay locally. By outsourcing tasks that are not specifically core to your organization, you'll have the opportunity to gain access to unique, affordable, and time-saving skills to give you a chance to focus your time, effort, and money on doing what you do best or what you prefer to do. Both pros and cons exist. If you are the kind of person who enjoys walking into an office and talking to the person doing the work and don't mind paying a premium to do so, perhaps this isn't for you. But if you are keen to learn about outsourcing, you know what result you want, and you are willing to put in the time, you may be able to get a unique and significantly less expensive result by outsourcing work all over the world. If you still aren't sure, remember that you have a range of powerful tools at your fingertips, which enable audio calling, video conferencing, and even screen share capability. In many cases, this is enough to build a solid relationship with your newfound developer on the other side of the world. On a side note, your local owned and operated design agency may actually be outsourcing all of its grunt work overseas as we speak and simply acting as relationship manager to their end client. If you're looking to pay up to 20 times more for a relationship manager to run your project, that's fine. But if you're excited about taking control of your project, let's give it a go. For the purpose of this audiobook, the term outsourcing relates to utilizing digital platforms to outsource your work to technology professionals all over the world. I have outsourced both design and development, administration and marketing work, typically web projects, to professionals in countries like India, Philippines, China, Singapore, Finland, Serbia, Uzbekistan, India, Argentina, and Romania. Examples in this audiobook, by default, will be about the development of websites, given that is one of the most common types of tasks being outsourced. However, in almost all cases, the same techniques and thought processes can be applied to any number of tasks. The only requirement is a little common sense. Anywhere a dollar value is quoted, it can be assumed that this is in U.S. currency. Quick tip. Still not sure? Go and check out Skype and GoToMeeting and utilize these platforms to collaborate on jobs and create strong relationships. Outsourcing versus Offshoring People often mix up the terms outsourcing and offshoring. The simple distinction? Outsourcing typically relates to the contracting of a project or task to an external organization, whereas offshoring relates to explicitly having work completed by an external company in a different country, usually to take advantage of reduced costs. In short, you can outsource to an individual or organization in your own country. For this to be offshoring, the organization being contracted must be in a different country. In many cases, if you outsource a task, you'll be both outsourcing and offshoring. However, for others, you may even find that it makes more sense for you to outsource a task to someone in your own country. There really isn't a right answer here. It all comes down to the specifics of the project. The Key Benefits by this stage, you probably don't need to be sold on the benefits of outsourcing your tasks to contractors all over the world. But in case you need just one more nudge, listen on. Lower costs. This is perhaps the number one reason people choose to outsource, a primary benefit. You can get work done at a fraction of the cost that you might need to spend locally, 
subject to where you are, of course. As was mentioned earlier, the cost of living is significantly lower in emerging countries where skilled workers don't need to charge inflated rates. Secondly, many of these people have created great efficiencies in the way they execute tasks. This enables significantly faster timeframes for execution, minimizing the total cost of a project. A web developer in an emerging country might charge between 10% and 30% of what a local developer may quote. Are they good? If you attended a university in a Western country, you know that it's entirely possible that 50% of your fellow students traveled from another country to study there. More and more students from emerging countries are studying at educational institutions in the West and returning home after completing their degree, diploma, or certificate. What does this result in? Well, if they learned the same skills as your local web designer at the same university and then traveled back to their homeland, where the cost to live is significantly lower, they can afford to undercut your local business owner while still delivering the same or possibly even better results. The clock. People often consider time difference to be a major outsourcing drawback. The truth is, however, with some smarts, this can be used as a huge advantage. How many of your competitors are developing and completing work 24 hours per day? Likely none. Consider this. If you live in the USA and your outsourced web designer is in Asia, literally on the other side of the world, you can brief them on a project or provide feedback at the end of the day, which works out to being the start of their day. While you sleep, they'll be working. When you wake up, you've got a product to assess. You can provide additional feedback and you can repeat the process. Talk about efficiency. You're literally getting work done while you sleep. Keeping focused. At the end of the day, you really want to spend time focusing on the reason why you started your business in the first place. That reason could be to save time, make more money, live a particular lifestyle, or make the world a better place. If you are able to remove the technical or administrative tasks from your workload and apply that focus to the task at hand, you'll be leading a more focused organization with the capability of scaling resources up and down as you see fit. Playing the safe game. When you outsource specific functions, you are able to reduce, minimize, or distribute the risks associated with performing that particular function. For every second you spend stressing over getting it right, you could be doing something else. Instead, have confidence in knowing that your task is being managed by a complete professional, thus reducing your need to appoint any valuable brain power to that segment of your business process. I read a great story recently about one outsourcer who outsourced his stressing and worrying. For 10 minutes each day, a contractor committed to worry for him, freeing him up to focus on other things. There was no need to stress, someone was looking after that already. Talk about playing it safe. Think of the children. In this case, the children are your customers. Think about their experience with your brand. Can you make their experience better with improved service, higher quality interactions, and great turnaround times? If you can do this by relieving yourself of some of the menial tasks you find yourself taking care of day in, day out, it's probably your responsibility to have someone take care of it. Not a manager? No worries. I've heard people say things like, I don't know how to manage staff, or I didn't start this to have to manage people. Guess what? You almost don't have to. Each of the digital platforms available out there have the functionality to help you to find, provide work to, and pay contractors, hence taking care of much of the management for you. Short of picking out the contractors and giving them work, they'll do it all. After setting up milestones, your workers will make life as easy as possible for you by doing things like sending you progress reports and reporting on milestones. 
the platforms typically even manage your payment options for you with simplified escrow accounts and complete payment facilitation. The First Timer Scenario While fictional, the following scenario demonstrates the approach that many outsourcers take when they launch their first outsourcing effort. This isn't designed to make the process sound simple or difficult, and by no means am I trying to intimidate you. This is simply designed to give you more clarity around the approach that many people take. Harold comes up with a great idea for a new blog, but after some investigation, he isn't happy with the templates of the existing blogging platforms he has seen. He decides the best option for him is to get a brand new site custom built. He proceeds to spend some time writing up content for his new site. While assessing some of the competitive sites in his niche market with similar content, he identifies that the site requires a blog page, an about me page, and a contact page. Harold draws up some sketches on paper to outline what he thinks the site should look like and takes screenshots of other sites that have interesting menus, color schemes, and designs. Harold loads up Elance, his preferred outsource platform, and commences writing up a brief. In this brief, he documents in as much detail as possible all aspects of the site. He lists what the purpose is, how many pages there will be, and the type of content that will be featured. He even goes into some detail, providing colors and designs he likes of existing sites, and includes the content he has drafted to date. As part of this brief, he has done his research, so he mentions he wants the website to be HTML, to not feature any flash, and to be on the open WordPress content management system. He has also already purchased his domain name and hosting package, so he adds these details. After writing his brief, he lists an appropriate price for the job. Just taking a stab in the dark, he lists the price for under $500 and posts the job on Elance. Harold is shocked to discover that within two hours, he has received 13 proposals to complete the job. A day later, there are close to 30 proposals from web developers from all over the world. He filters through the proposals and finds three developers that he really likes. After emailing each of them additional questions about their current workload and design choices, he gets a response from one almost instantly, stating he or she is ready to commence work. Harold awards the job to that developer and work commences. Together, they have a weekly catch-up via Skype and use the built-in messenger within the Elance platform to discuss the project. Four weeks later, the final website is finished. Harold is happy, the developer is happy, and everyone wins. Does this sound like something that excites you? Does it sound difficult? It can be a little. Can there be complications? Sometimes. Is it worth attempting? Yes. So you're still listening. This means you're committed, you've got your idea, and you're ready to start. Let's get on with it and talk about the nuts and bolts of online outsourcing. Quick tip. Check out the project upgrades available on freelancer.com, including Featured Project, Private Project, and Sealed Project to make your brief more compelling. Chapter 2. A History Lesson The History of Outsourcing The term freelancer was first coined by Sir Walter Scott in 1820. The term was used to describe a mercenary warrior in medieval times who was a freelance. This indicated that a particular lance was not sworn to any one lord and had the flexibility to negotiate and stand in battle for multiple parties, ideally not in the same battle. The phrase has never indicated that free reflects cost of services, but more so that the agent was not tied to any one single entity. The term was recognized as a verb, for example, I know an engineer who freelances, by 1903, by a range of authoritative references, sources, and dictionaries.
Skip forward 90 years, and in the 1990s, the widespread nature of the Internet opened up opportunities for global freelancing to occur, which, for the first time, made logistically managing outsourced relationships simpler and more accessible for the masses. One of the first online platforms created to deal with the opportunity the Internet created was Guru.com, which was founded as eMoonlighter.com. The site was created as an online house for workers in the technology industry seeking short-term contracts. By 1999, Elance launched the first version of their site with the view that there was an opportunity to create a platform that better supported virtual working environments. VWorker was founded in 2001 under the name Rent-A-Coder. Ian Ippolito, the founder, had previously launched a website that was built to enable the sharing of source code from computer programs and launched Rent-A-Coder to act as a platform for intermediating paid programming projects. Even more recently, a growing trend in crowdsourcing platforms have become increasingly evident. Platforms such as Mechanical Turk and 99designs enable individuals to leverage the skills and capability of multiple freelancers to create micro-tasks, either in competition with other freelancers to win a contract or collaboratively as part of an overall project. In 2005, the U.S. Department of Labor approximated that 10.3 million, or 7.4 percent of the U.S. workforce, were independent contractors. Today, some of the more popular countries that freelancers occupy include India, Indonesia, Estonia, Singapore, China, Bulgaria, Philippines, Thailand, Lithuania, and Malaysia. This is due to the competitive nature of local work, education levels, the, often, low cost of living, and the widespread availability of Internet access. Chapter 3. Validating Your Idea Confidence An ongoing query from a number of readers has been that they are unsure of when it's the right time to outsource their first job. Prior to commencing, it is important that you're confident in yourself and the project you're working on to ensure the highest likelihood of success for the completion, delivery, and longevity of your big idea. Your personal confidence levels in the projects you're working on will significantly impact your speed to market and capability. It's fine to be simply testing or playing with a new idea, but when push comes to shove, those who are not confident and committed to their project will not reap the rewards associated with the execution of positively impacting the world with proactive and useful products. Those who truly care will not only invest their own time into their project, but they'll invest their money, they'll hold themselves accountable for frequent progress and assign tight timelines with almost unachievable goals to accomplish. These challenges will push those who are truly confident in themselves to achieve great things. If you are one of these people who are completely confident in yourself, your project, and the capability you have for making your dent in the universe, skip to the next chapter. If you need some help to lock down what's truly important to you, continue listening. There are a range of risks that can occur when attempting to execute on a large-scale project, and without the self-confidence to deliver, your uneasiness will be reflected in your communication with your contractor and your willingness to commit to your project. In many cases, those who are not confident will take less risks, will be particularly critical of their own ideas, which results in them being much slower to market and significantly less likely to actually deliver. In some cases, even upon completion, these entrepreneurs will sabotage or jeopardize the success of their own projects in order to reduce the fear of rejection and failure. There is a mentality and thought process going around which suggests that I'd rather quit and fail on my terms rather than fail publicly. You need not think like this, because when you're passionate and enthusiastic about what you do, Failure is not an option. 
While it's crucial to build personal confidence in your projects, it's also important to be well aware of the benefits of being critical of your own ideas. On an ongoing basis, you should be asking yourself a series of questions to ensure you're comfortable with not only your idea, but the market around you, hence instilling self-confidence throughout the entire process. These questions that you ask yourself on a frequent basis should include, is my project a good idea? What is the likelihood of this project seeing the light of day? Will my efforts be rewarded with participation from my target market? What has changed in the marketplace that will impact the success of my project? When asking these questions, entrepreneurs are able to gauge their own sense of confidence as they continue down their development path. While being aware of market changes enables the shuffling of priorities or project requirements to best take advantage of the opportunities available. If you've got your idea concrete and ready, but are still lacking the confidence to take action, it's important that you take a step back and identify where your limiting beliefs exist and get very clear on why it's important that your idea or product is brought to life. This assessment needs not only take place on an entrepreneurial or aspirational level, but on a personal needs level. Do you know the direction your life is going to take? Do you know what you're aiming for? Do you know what the single point of success is and what that will mean for your life? While not typical for an audiobook focused on educating readers on a business-related topic like outsourcing, it might be worthwhile to take a trip down a side road for a moment and identify which direction you're driving in. Let's go through a quick exercise to help you identify your ideal life. When you've completed this exercise, you'll be able to make decisions about your projects with an increased confidence. This comes from knowing that you have the power to determine whether the success of your current projects will have implications that result in you living your ideal life. The exercise. Take a moment to pull out a notepad, sketchbook, or your preferred word processor and prepare to write down a series of notes. Imagine for a moment that you have more money than you could ever know what to do with. Imagine that the life you dream of today is the one you're living, day in, day out. Think for a moment and consider, what would my ideal life be like? What would I do? Not only what would I do for work or to generate income, remember you don't have to generate income, but every minute of the day, what would I do? When I wake up in the morning, where do I live? Who am I waking up next to? What can I hear? Is it the ocean? Is it the birds? When I get out of bed, where do I go? Do I get breakfast? What do I eat? What do I look at while I eat? What do I do after breakfast? Who do I talk to? What do I do? Who am I friends with? What do I do for entertainment? Do I continue to work? What am I doing? Consider every possible aspect of your life and list on paper, if I could make my ideal life possible today, this is what it would consist of. There are no limitations. List step by step what you see, what you feel, what you do. Once you've completed this exercise, do some Google image searches for pictures that accurately represent the ideal life you've pictured in your head and add these to a document. This is going to become your vision board, which when printed should be attached to the walls of the areas that you occupy most. See, when you know what you want, when you can see it, and you are passionate, excited, and hungry to achieve it, you'll take huge steps in order to make it a reality. Without this vision, however, you can't know what you're working towards, and without that awareness, it's too easy to fall into complacency. If you've got a passion, skill, or desire to live your ideal life, and you know you've got the entrepreneurial gene to add value to the world, it's your responsibility to take action today and add this value. Because when you do, you'll know just how easy it is to live your ideal life. Business Model Strategy and Preparation 
When you're clear on a personal level that you know what you're striving for, the following steps are simple. Let's talk tactically about getting clear on your business or project and preparing your strategy. Immediately understand exactly what you're looking to outsource. This could be leveraging a virtual assistant, getting a report edited, or some design and development. Now, take a step back and think strategy. Consider what are you building? What purpose will it serve? Who is your audience? Why will they care about it? If this is a business, what is your distribution method? What is your revenue model? How are you going to engage your customers? If you've got answers to all of these questions and you can honestly commit to yourself that they are true, accurate, and correct, let's get creative. It's time to add some structure to your strategy. I'd like to invite you to take a look at the Business Model Canvas, as featured in the book Business Model Generation by Alexander Osterwalder and Eve Pinier, along with 470 other co-contributors. The Business Model Canvas is a one-page business model visualization and business design manipulation tool, which will provide you with the ultimate clarity and brainstorming potential for establishing a solid business model. Consider yourself warned, this model is for those who are prepared to no longer follow traditional conventions and embrace innovative models of value creation. Your next step is to print the Business Model Canvas, available for free PDF download from www.businessmodelgeneration.com, and using post-it notes, fill in specific points of information in each of the nine building blocks. These include customer segments, channels, customer relationships, revenue streams, key resources, key activities, key partners, and the cost structure. You'll quickly identify the value in a tool like the Canvas when you've completed this task once or twice. Not only does it form a powerful methodology for explaining your project to someone else, but you'll find yourself continuing to iterate on your idea to ensure the highest likelihood of success. Perhaps the next method for building confidence occurs when you're looking to build a long-term sustainable business. We've heard time and time again that those who are successful are so because they are capable of building strong teams around them. Consider who you know or who you need to meet who will be excited about your business concept and is able to add massive value in helping you on your path. Build your personal board or advice panel made up with mentors that you know or are able to meet. Attend local meetup groups that are based around the same topic or market that your business operates in. www.meetup.com is your friend here. With good support, structure, milestones, goal setting, and tactical strategy, you'll have the ultimate confidence as you commence your outsourcing journey. The final method for building confidence in both yourself and your idea is in validating the business as a concept. This means you've determined what the actual problem is that you're trying to solve, your prospect customers believe that you hold the solution, and you've validated that what you're building is relevant and applicable long before any product is built. Wouldn't you rather know whether it was going to work before you invested any time and money? This phase can't take place without actually talking to potential customers. You need to determine what their true needs are and ensure that what you're building will solve their problems. Typically, entrepreneurs build for themselves and neglect to involve the outside world before their product is ready. My advice to you is to drop your guard and get outside the building. Find your ideal customer and talk to them about the problem you're trying to solve. This will ultimately ensure that when you do launch, you'll be as close to product market fit as possible. Chapter 4. The Platforms This is where you'll spend most of your time. The very first step is choosing which platform you want to use to outsource your work. You'll be using the same platform for everything, from researching to pitching your job, selecting a contractor, managing that contractor, and finally, paying that contractor. 
To help you decide, here is a comparison of some of the more popular sites. One note before you start. Don't join all sites and attempt to run a profile on each simultaneously. I suspect this will result in you ending up dazed, confused, and unsure about the whole experience. Pick the platform that seems to best suit you and your project and test out the experience with a small or simple job. Quick tip. You should do your own research here. Each platform is different, and you're better off jumping into a platform that feels simple and intuitive for you. The following evaluations on each platform are simply my own interpretations. I have not been paid by any of these companies, nor have they had any involvement in crafting the following descriptions. Only key points that I believed were of interest or differentiators are mentioned. While I have strived for accuracy, understand that anything mentioned herein could be outdated, inaccurate, or incomplete. Therefore, before relying on this information, visit each of the sites I mention, in addition to any of the many other sites, and come to your own conclusions. Elance Elance is one of the most popular websites for managing web and design outsourcing tasks. Like many of the listed sites, Elance enables you to search for contractors, post a job, select a supplier, manage the project, and pay the contractor, all within the Elance platform. In my experience, Elance contains the largest network of contractors, the quality of contractors is typically good, and scaling up your resourcing is extremely quick and easy. For example, for a recent job, I drafted a brief, selected a contractor, and had him begin work, all within 45 minutes. Elance operates with a workroom concept, with new workrooms created for each job or projects you are running simultaneously. Here you can share messages, files, and screenshots, and all of your communications are automatically saved. Quick tip. You can invite coworkers to join your Elance workroom. This creates a fantastic opportunity to work collaboratively with your freelancer and those who know your business inside and out. With Elance, you can hire by the hour or for a complete project. Pros and cons exist for both approaches. A general rule of thumb. If you know explicitly what you want and you know exactly what goes into doing it, paying by the hour can work out fine. In many cases, however, this will generate uncertainty about how long the project may take to complete. Instead, many people prefer to pay a set fee for a completed project. The advantage here is that any questions a contractor may have had or any changes requested by the outsourcer are typically factored into the overarching price for the entire project, within reason. Elance has a great escrow account model. When you agree to proceed with a new project, you can set up milestones and prepay your money to an escrow account. This will give the contractor the confidence in knowing that you do actually have the money, even though they won't receive it until the job is completed. When you pay for the completed work, Elance will deduct its fee as a percentage of each payment, dependent on the project budget. The remainder is transferred directly to the contractor. There is also a small, one-time account activation fee when you set up an employer account. From a hiring perspective, this is the only upfront fee you are hit with. Freelancer Freelancer is an outsourcing platform that started out of Sydney, Australia. Freelancer is a popular solution for project-based tasks and incorporates a variety of options for listing your project. Like on Elance, Freelancer features options for hiring either by the hour or for a complete project. Pros and cons exist for both approaches. You'll need to assess which model is best for you based on the project. Freelancer also provides an interesting contest feature whereby an employer can post a contest with a reward and instead of following the typical model of paying a contractor and the contractor then doing the work, a number of contractors can submit an entry from which the employer can select one and reward the fee with an opportunity to buy multiple submissions if they wish. This is a great feature for new contractors who are looking to grow their portfolios and improve their credibility. 
Freelancer has a relatively complex fee system. As an employer, it's free to join Freelancer, and posting your first project is free. There is a tiered membership plan which reduces the applicable fees, depending on the plan selected, and each tier enables more functionality. Just assess how you plan to use the site and you'll have a pretty good idea of which tier to jump in on. Freelancer also operates a subscription membership plan for contractors. These plans include free, basic, standard, and premium. Each of these plans require a monthly payment outside of the free subscription, and they have scalable benefits based on the selected plan. Odesk Odesk is a competitive outsourcing platform which enables its users to take control of a powerful hourly rate system and actually assess quality of work and the efficiency of workers with a range of verification features. Odesk has a Team Room feature, which allows contractors to see each team member's activity levels, including mouse and keyboard activity. This, in conjunction with the Feedback module, which features a work diary and the capability of requesting webcam access or screenshots of workers' screens, ensures that the workers to whom you are paying an hourly rate are held far more accountable. Odesk has a default percentage-based fee, which it charges on top of the amount paid to the contractor. Guru Guru is another tool which enables the employer to simply pay for work completed. Guru has a much higher ratio of Western contractors to emerging country contractors. For example, the USA is home to the vast majority of workers on the platform. For this reason alone, Guru is an incredible platform for those new to outsourcing online or those who have a project that requires verbal discussions and updates. If you would like a Western contractor specifically, this might be a good platform to try. Guru offers a more complex fee structure than other platforms. There are a range of monthly membership subscription fees. In addition, there are percentage fees for listing a project, for utilizing the escrow account feature, and for additional payment options such as payment via check or wire transfer. VWorker Formerly titled rent a coder VWorker is a platform with a large percentage of IT roles available at the disposal of its users. Users can either pay for deliverables at completion or pay for time based on an hourly rate. VWorker is a popular all-rounder platform for managing projects of various types and for working with contractors from a good mix of countries all over the world. As a platform, it also provides the rare feature of enabling employers to request a screenshot of their workers' screens or a shot from their webcams at any time. With a range of options, the workers usually have a percentage deducted from their total fees as a payment to the service. There are also added benefits of using a preferred payment method. The cost of doing business. At the end of the day, every platform differs in regard to the types of workers it engages and the tools it makes available to users. If, for example, you are looking for a tool that allows you to closely monitor the actions of your workers, you might like the screenshot or webcam request function whereby you can ask for a status report on the spot, accompanied by a visual representation of the work done to date. In this case, Odesk or VWorker might be the right platform for you. If alternatively you are looking for a platform where you can post a simple job for a flat fee and get a range of responses, Elance may be a better option. Finally, if you have a task that would be better managed by a native English speaker or you have a need to verbally discuss your project with your team, you might like to check out Guru. Remember, every platform is different and each has its own benefits. Pricing among all platforms is relatively similar, with each slightly tweaking its fee structure. A key recommendation is to consider how frequently you plan to use the service before you commit to signing up for a monthly subscription plan. This is especially the case when some of these plans can cost a significantly higher monthly fee. Regardless of what you've heard here, always do your research and review the individual terms on each platform. Platforms you may not have considered. 
Although you may not have considered it, there are a few other platforms that may be worth investigating. These are not necessarily conventional outsourcing platforms, however they can certainly be used to simplify or reduce output required for specific jobs. TaskRabbit TaskRabbit is a relatively new, U.S.-only service, which has taken an interesting approach to enabling the outsourcing of physical tasks. Like any platform, contractors bid on jobs and, once selected, will complete the task. The difference here is that these tasks are typically real-world, meaning that TaskRabbit is often used for assistance in tasks such as assembling IKEA furniture, delivering a product, or helping you to move house. While I don't talk too much about physical outsourcing in this book, TaskRabbit is worth mentioning. I had a great experience using it in a corporate setting when I needed to have someone next to me doing some specific data entry work, and the service was near flawless. Fancy Hands Fancy Hands is another relatively new service with a twist. All Fancy Hands contractors are U.S.-based and highly skilled to take on administrative tasks. Rather than bid on jobs, the outsourcer will list the job they want completed, a contractor will step in, determine how complex the job is, and complete it accordingly. Fancy Hands is a subscription-only service, so prior to allocating work, users must make a call on how much they plan to use the service and pay for this accordingly on a monthly basis. Fiverr Fiverr is possibly one of the most simplistic and underrated sites on the Internet. Users post what they're willing to do for $5, and anyone can take them up on that. Everything from logo design to internet marketing advice. It isn't traditional outsourcing, but I bet you'll be amazed at what you can get done. Chapter 5. Virtual Assistants It doesn't matter whether you're a high-rolling, five-time entrepreneur or a first-timer with an interesting idea, we all get overloaded with work to do. In many cases, it's common to employ support staff very early in the startup phase to ensure administrative or tedious tasks are completed and don't slip through the cracks. In the last five years, it has become increasingly common to engage support or administrative staff via digital outsourcing platforms to assist in day-to-day -day work. In essence, a virtual assistant, VA, works in much the same way that a local employee would operate. As an employer, your role is to communicate tasks, typically of an administrative nature, which require completing in as fast and as high a quality as possible. Virtual assistants often operate within a corporate or agency-type environment and are engaged and managed through a bigger organization. They will often also bid for direct administrative roles via platforms like Elance. An additional benefit is, as a result of the typical engagement and payment structure, in many cases virtual assistants can either operate via a subscription package to provide support on an ongoing basis, or work on a month-to-month -month or week-to-week -week time frame, on a retainer of a specific number of hours for that set period. There are a range of additional benefits that can occur when engaging a virtual assistant. Firstly, by leveraging an international virtual assistant, you will be paying for the hours actually worked and you can focus on saving 60% to 70% of local staffing costs due to you not having a staff member occupying a desk regardless of workload. Like all outsourcing, you can also take advantage and leverage around-the-clock operations due to your employee functioning in a different time zone to you. Everyone loves to work and make money while they sleep. Work that is typically engaged by a virtual assistant may include writing, formatting important documents, diary management, web-based research, travel bookings, data entry, or even CRM support. However, the best virtual assistants are not limited to these tasks. Some are highly skilled and can take on a range of more complex jobs. These could include liaising with clients and customers, telephone support, reception assistance or technical support, lead generation and opportunity identification, media monitoring, 
event management, or digital marketing. If you are in the market to engage a virtual assistant, it pays to do your research. There are literally hundreds of platforms and agencies that manage this process. You should always request a short trial phase to determine how a particular company's virtual assistant facilitation process operates in terms of management, accounts or payment, skill and capability, and human resources. Next time you have a menial, administrative function that you're working through, why not try out leveraging a freelancer and assess your progress? How much does my VA know about me? Perhaps the most frequent query I receive when people are considering engaging a virtual assistant is based around the security of their personal data. A long-standing relationship with a good virtual assistant will result in them likely knowing everything about you, from credit card details to family history to the make of car you drive, your address, even your medical history. This is often a tough pill to swallow. However, there are a number of small tactics you can implement to ensure your identity and bank account remain safe. Firstly, when selecting a virtual assistant, you should always be on the mission to find one with a solid history, with good ratings and references. There is absolutely nothing wrong with asking a potential hire for former managerial references so that you can conduct a check. By doing this simple task, you will greatly reduce the potential risk of having a bad experience. After you've hired your virtual assistant, a small tactic is to create new user accounts with new passwords for the websites you would like your contractor to access on your behalf. This is especially important if you like to use the same password for all of your web services. One final idea is around the security of credit cards. Ideally, you'd provide your credit card details to your virtual assistant so that they're empowered to make specific purchases on your behalf, obviously with agreed limits in place. However, rather than giving a new contractor your existing credit card details, inquire with your bank about preloaded credit cards. Many banks provide cards where you can add, let's say, $500 in credit to the card with a maximum daily spend of $100. As expenses are made, you can be notified via email, and if something appears to be fraudulent, you can have the card canceled. This is a great way to both empower your assistant to work autonomously while protecting your most important assets. Chapter 6. Getting Your Requirements Down Knowing What You Want so you've got a fantastic idea for a new website. In fact, for the purposes of this chapter, let's assume you want to create a new website for yourself or your business. The same principles, of course, can be applied to any situation. Simply apply a little common sense. You've done all the research, there is a customer need, your partners are waiting, and you've got marketing tactics ready to roll. It's time to get to work. You can't simply jump onto an outsourcing platform and write up a brief stating, I need a new website for my business. Consider firstly the purpose and format of the website. Does it need an online store, a newsletter sign up, a contact form, social media integration, an about page, a product portfolio, a blog or news section, or even a membership login section? What do you want to be on the home page? What other pages do you need, and in what order should they appear in the menu? Do you even have a menu? If you're unable to answer yes or no to any of these questions, you've got work to do. Think about the structure and divide each page of the site into modules. What modules do you want? Where do you want these modules to feature? What color scheme do you want for the website? Do you have a logo? Where should it appear? Start by drawing these on paper. This will go a long way in helping you to determine what the user's experience will be like. Consider usability in this process. Do some research into trends in your industry. How are your competitors quoting for a product or pushing their social media pages? Learn from them and include all of these observations in your brief. 
The example. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Don't, because there is a simple way of doing this. Firstly, list the key features of your proposed site. Then take a few sheets of paper and draw your site. Draw where the main menu, the header, and your logo should sit. Then draw in your content sections, even considering what colors should appear where. The following highlights an example demonstrating some of the points you should consider including in your requirements. Content section A. Home page. Include text included in this section. Attach images that will feature in this section. Include any links, forms, or buttons that should appear in this section. Contact page. Include contact form containing areas full name, email address, and comment box. Note that on completion of the form, data should be sent to info at mydomain.com. Include text appearing prior to contact form and text after contact form. Product list. List each product by category. Product images, descriptions, and any other details should be included at this time. List these in a grid formation with four products along the top line and four rows. At the end of each row, provide arrows to link to the next page. Include links to more information about each product, large product images, and the Add to Cart feature under each product. Of course, you need to provide a significantly more comprehensive document to your contractor, but this gives you an indication of one method for articulating what content should appear where. Legends, as mentioned earlier, can be helpful. You might, for example, mark different modules on drawings, demonstrating the desired color scheme for that section. For example, link color, blue, rollover link color, red, Background color, light gray, header text, blue. Support these color guidelines with screenshots from other websites with similar or the same colors you are looking for. If you have a brand style guide, this should be provided to your contractor in the very early stages, as it will very clearly impact the design of the website and simplify the early stages of the project. If you don't have an operational style guide, which is more often the case for entrepreneurs or small business owners, you should be seeking out a designer whose past work you like, because his or her eye for design will become increasingly important throughout the project. When you're considering what you want your website to look like and what content should appear within it, let's assume you've got a pretty good understanding of what your competitors are doing, you should start to take screenshots of other websites you like and include these in a Word document accompanied by notes and links to the relevant page. These screenshots and links will be extremely useful for your designer. If you like a particular type of blog format, the way a vertical page slider looks, or the way two color gradients integrate, take shots of all of these points. Any good designer will be able to apply the aspects you like from other sites into your website using your own colors and styles. If you are flexible, it will also pay to take screenshots of and provide links to your competitors' pages, as your designer may well come up with a new or different way of displaying similar content. The biggest takeaway from this section is that you need to know what you want. Know what you want your website to look like, what you want it to do, the pages that will feature within it, and have all of the content ready to go. At this point, you should document your requirements. Your requirements document should feature all of the earlier mentioned detail about your desired website so that the instant you select a contractor, he or she can read up and get working. With good requirements and content ready, your contractor will be able to reduce time asking questions and waiting on you. When you write up your requirements, remember you're articulating what you want your website to do. If you skip on the detail here, you can expect a low-quality product. Add as much detail as possible and ensure that your contractor knows exactly what you're looking for. For the purposes of this section, some key aspects you might consider including in a requirements document include 1. 
break up the website by pages as previously discussed. Have sections for the home page, blog, news, contact, about, portfolio, products, and any other pages you might have. 2. Draw on a series of A4 sheets of paper the basic website layout for each page and, using a legend, break the site into sections. For example, Content Section A. You'll be able to then reference each section in any accompanying notes. 3. Ensure you've articulated what content should appear on every page. For example, the main menu, header, and logo will remain consistent on each page. When you roll over the menu items, the individual items should flash silver, like they do at www.inspirationsite.com. When you click on the header, which will state header text in Arial font and should be larger than 32-point font, it should link to the home page of the site, regardless of which page the user is on. Social links should appear below Content Section A at the bottom right of the page, and there should be a Facebook Like button just below the bottom right corner of the page, which links to www.facebook.com forward slash My Company page. 4. As you articulate the functions of every page, you should include the color scheme of the website. If you have brand guidelines or any brand requirements, these should be provided. If not, and you are flexible as to how the site is designed, provide any other material you might have that are on brand, for example, brochures, sales letters, email signatures, or even business cards. 5. Find inspirational elements on other sites that you love. If you like the way a particular website element looks or functions, take a screenshot and provide this image with a link to the page and a note to describe what you like about it and how you would like it to be implemented. This will give your designer clarity around your design expectations. 6. If you're looking at building a collaborative relationship with your contractor, also take screenshots of key features on your competitors' websites in order to collaborate on how you might be able to do it better. 7. Have the content ready. This is key. So many sites are held up and not delivered on time because the outsourcer only has positional content for the purposes of development and has not confirmed content that is ready to go. When you engage a contractor, you'll be excited to get the new site ready as quickly as possible. While this is great, you should always ensure that they have all of the content they need to design the site around the content and not require that you change the content and your message because you need to fit it into a freshly built template. 8. Ensure you describe the what and how. If you're referencing links or buttons, be clear about what these should do and where they should go. If you want the website to have a feature, ensure the developer knows what the feature is and what it should do. The key thing to remember when writing up your requirements is to make them simple. Leave nothing to chance. You should be able to give it to someone who isn't technically savvy and have him or her understand and be able to explain the website to you highlighting everything from purpose to design to usability. If he or she is able to do this, you've probably written a cohesive requirements document. Technicalities and Content Management Systems Although we don't want to dive too deep into this topic, I thought it might be useful to cover this briefly. In the case of any web development job, you'll typically use a content management system, CMS. The CMS is the back-end infrastructure that allows you, as an administrator, to log into your website and change any part of the website you like, typically content, but in theory, everything from design to content to functionality without any programming skills at all. Many web developers will prefer one of a couple of content management systems over others. In most cases, this isn't a big issue, but here's a key tip. If you've never managed a website before, stick to one of the more popular solutions such as WordPress, Drupal, or Joomla. Quick tip. Open source can be great, 
as you'll have the added benefit of third-party developers working to improve that CMS's operating environment. For a great list of what's available, check out this great Wikipedia page, http colon forward slash forward slash en dot wikipedia dot org forward slash wiki forward slash list underscore of underscore content underscore management underscore systems. Another important technical aspect that any outsourcer should learn about is web standards. You should have a basic understanding about the programming languages required to build your desired website. Ten years ago, it was amazing to include flash elements in your website to enhance the interactivity of a website. But since 2007 and the introduction by Apple of the iPhone, there has been a strong push against Flash as a development tool for a range of reasons. Depending on the nature of your product, you should understand the types of programming languages required. Based on the development feature set and approach, understand why you would choose one over the other. Quick tip. I personally recommend against using Flash as a method of web development these days due to the increases in mobile and tablet browsing. These devices typically do not have a strong capability to display Flash content. Browser capability. That's right, browser capability. Not a sexy or fun topic to talk about, but fairly simple and very important. When writing up your technical requirements for your website, clearly define that you want your website to be experienced in a similar way from browser to browser. In fact, I'd suggest you request that your website functions with, at most, a 99% variance between the recent versions of the most used browsers, specifically Microsoft Internet Explorer, Apple Safari, Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, and Opera. You should also understand that if you are looking for a modern website and are looking to use modern web standards, you'll have to draw a line as to where your website will not necessarily be supported. For example, if someone switches on his late 1990s Dell, loads up a prehistoric version of Microsoft's Internet Explorer, and goes to your new website, you should be aware that it's not necessarily going to load up featuring world-class design. It's the nature of the beast for new websites to be built to the most recent design standards, provided your new product isn't specifically geared to a market who notoriously refuse to upgrade their system. Generally speaking, if you build your website to recent standards, you'll be happy with the result. If you are particularly concerned with specific code, you can actually have a notification pushed to users of unsupported browsers stating that your website is best displayed with a more recent browser, with steps to upgrade their current system. Be aware of what is currently available and discuss this with the contractor you choose. This isn't a difficult point to understand, but it's important that you're aware of it and discuss this as you communicate your expectations. Reality. The examples in this book are strongly focused on customized web design and development projects. However, the reality is that I actually don't think you need a custom build. I bet you think you do, but reality is that you don't. I have a go-to tactic for all new websites that I build. Here is my workflow for just about any website. 1. I visit www.bluehost.com, or comparable domain name and hosting provider, purchase domain name and hosting, typically for under $100. 2. I head to www.themeforest.net and or www.woothemes.com, and I'll search for a WordPress theme that reflects my site and brand, and purchase it for around $60. 3. I log into the hosting package at www.bluehost.com and configure a WordPress installation. There is plenty of information on how to do this online. Simply Google how to install WordPress on Bluehost. 4. I log into WordPress, upload the theme, and start editing content. 5. If I need changes made, I'll contact a developer via an outsourcing platform, pay them for two hours of their time to tweak the code to make changes to structure, colors, and design. 
This workflow requires zero development skill, and you'll walk away in half an hour with a brand new, incredibly professional website. Chapter 7 Writing the Brief What's the brief? Your brief is essentially the job board posting. This is the title and description you'll provide to get contractors interested in the opportunity and bidding on the job accordingly. The goal here is to provide a clear and concise description of the task at hand so that any number of contractors are clear on exactly what is required. You should also keep in mind that the goal is to generate as many bids for the job as possible. As a result, you need to consider SEO, search engine optimization, in your brief. A virtual assistant is no doubt searching for opportunities that reference the phrase virtual assistant in the title. So, in order to make sure your jobs are found by the most appropriate contractors, list keywords in the article and description that you believe your ideal contractor is searching for. Your brief should feature short sentences, have one possible interpretation, and be suitable for a second grade reading level. You want your contractor to truly understand the task at hand, and if you're using buzzwords or shorthand, it's quite possible that you'll end up selecting a provider that isn't as compatible with you as you'd like. But what do I say? The brief should generally be quite simple to write. Just consider what you need to tell someone so that they can, stick with me here, draw your website on a piece of paper. Your brief really should just be as simple as just a few paragraphs to help you track down a few key contractors to choose from. This is my preferred methodology for writing a brief. 1. What Introduce yourself and explain what you do, what your project is, and what the desired effect is of having the work completed. 2. Detailed what Break down in some depth what you're actually looking for. An example would be, This is a five-page website to promote a new product. The home page will feature text and images. The product page will feature large screenshots with text and embedded YouTube videos. The blog will be a standard blog. I should be able to edit this via the selected CMS in the deliverables section. The pricing page will be a pricing chart with five different payment options, which should integrate with a standard checkout page or plugin. Finally, the contact page will feature a web form that will email to me, an address with Google Map integration, and a phone number. 3. Deliverables List exactly what you expect to actually get as a result of the completed work. In the case of a website, you might ask for All designs for each page of the website in the relevant layered files. This will typically be an Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, or Fireworks file. The website in its entirety. Developed and available for access using your domain name and on your hosting package. 4. Look and feel. How deeply and well-formulated your current brand strategy is will dictate how much clarity you're able to provide here. If you have a current website, logo, desired colors, right down to hex RGB codes, fonts, and design principles, then these should all be provided in the brief. It should be communicated that these colors, fonts, and design principles should all be strictly utilized. If you don't have a detailed brand strategy, this is a great opportunity to create one using new design assets that complement your company. 5. Layout Put some thought into the design and layout of your site. Do you have any thoughts about whether you want a vertical or horizontal menu? Do you know where you want your logo to sit? If you do, make this known now. If not, search around at other sites and use these to brainstorm what it is that you'd like or dislike for your own site. If you don't know, or particularly care, and are looking for some guidance from your designer, make it known in your brief that you want to work with a designer in a collaborative environment all the way through the design process. 6. Extra Resources Provide links to aspects of other websites you like, 
either entirely or screenshots of parts of websites, for example, menus, scrolling bars, and contact forms. Send links to your competitors' pages in order for the contractor to get an idea of how they are positioned in the market. Brief versus Requirements So you've decided you want a website, you've written a great brief, and you've drafted your website requirements from the previous chapter. It's now time to get this thing online and get some bids coming in. You have two options. Firstly, you can provide your brief in as simple a way as possible. Without going into elaborate depth, simply describe what your website or project will be built to achieve, how many pages there are going to be, highlighting basic functionality and design. This strategy will get you the highest number of bids because of the high-level detail. As a result, you'll be able to review a huge list of prospect contractors and zoom in on one or shortlist a couple accordingly. There is a second strategy that slightly differs. However, this isn't one that I'd recommend if you're concerned about confidentiality, intellectual property, or your competitors finding out information about your new project. This strategy requires that you provide a significant amount of information up front in your brief, including your full requirements document, so there is no ambiguity about what you actually want. This strategy should get you better qualified bids. You are likely to get a much shorter list of proposals, which should reduce the amount of time you spend validating the bidders. If you'd prefer this option, write a short brief outlining what the project is, then attach the detailed functional requirements. Regardless of the strategy you choose, before you select a contractor, my recommendation is that you provide, at the very least, the shortlisted bidders with your full requirements. This enables you to select a few that look like strong bidders and enable them to update their bid or withdraw it when they know what you're looking for in great depth. The expectations of you. Unless you clearly specify it in the brief, in the case of a website, you'll typically need to purchase the website domain name and hosting package separately to the project. You'll want to provide these details to your contractor as soon as practical to ensure he or she can configure your content management system and get this loaded on your hosting platform. There are a huge range of contractors available to help you complete these tasks, so if you find yourself stuck, just ask. Check out the resources section near the end of this audiobook for more information. The Brief – Featured or Free Many of the outsourcing platforms enable you to pay to have your brief featured above others. In most cases, I would suggest that you don't need to pay extra to make your brief stand out. Consider this to be similar to the SEO, Search Engine Optimization, versus SEM, Search Engine Marketing, decision. You can choose to write a little and pay to have it featured more prominently, or you can invest some more time, add some more detail, and in turn more keywords, and appear in search results organically. If you have a detailed brief, it will typically appear well in searches on your selected outsourcing platform. As a result, you probably won't need to pay the extra few bucks to have your brief featured. For the majority of jobs, there are thousands of capable and honest contractors on each of these sites. If you post a well-thought-out and detailed brief with a reasonable pricing bracket, you'll be satisfied with the interest you receive in the first few hours, regardless of whether you go featured or free. The only reason I'd suggest you should feature a brief would be in the case that it is particularly urgent that you kick off the project. But in any case, even if listing it as a free job, you're likely to have a sufficient number of proposals in the first 24 hours, dependent on the job, brief, and price listed. Chapter 8. Pricing Your Project Prior to posting your job, you'll be positioned with what might be an awkward predicament. You'll typically be asked whether you want to pay via an hourly rate or with a total project fee. If this is your first time, it's important to know that there are a range of methods that exist for determining an appropriate cost for your project. 
Now, we will examine a few unique methods. In this process, there are a few key principles. 1. Do your research. Look at what others are charging or paying on your outsourcing platform of choice. This is easy to browse, and you'll be far better informed about what to expect and what's reasonable. 2. Don't always look for the cheapest price. You're already saving huge amounts of money by outsourcing online. Take the time to choose a contractor you believe you can build a relationship with rather than the one with the lowest bid. 3. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. No one is going to work forever, especially for a one-off fixed price. Understand that while you'll be offered things like unlimited revisions, this is within reason. You'll need to reinvest after a point if you find there is a continual back and forth. One favorite strategy for picking your price is to go down the road or pick up the phone and speak with a local designer, developer, or contractor. Explain your project and ask him or her for a quote for development. This will give you a good base price to compare with. For one of my projects, I'd worked out that for a basic website, I could expect to pay around 10% to an outsourced contractor of what I'd be paying walking into a local design agency. In this case, the local agency had expected the job would cost around $1,500, whereas by outsourcing, I was able to get the entire job completed for just under $200. If you are building something more complex, like a mobile application or software tool, you can often expect to pay between 5% and 8% for an outsourced contractor, as you'll find your local agency may well not be skilled enough to take on the task and will need to bring on staff or even outsource themselves, although they likely won't tell you that, to complete the job. Once you've got an idea of a broad price that sounds about right based on your project, the platform, and the contractors bidding on your brief, one strategy is to select a bidder with a moderately high bid. Sounds counterproductive? Listen on. If, for example, you are building a website and expect design and development work for the full project should cost around $200, you might go on Elance and select the price bracket, inviting bids up to $500. You'll likely get up to 30 bids depending on the quality of your brief, with a majority ranging between $100 and $200. As you filter through the bids, focus on those that sit in the $200 to $300 bracket as these contractors are more likely to have read the brief and tailored a specific reply to you rather than a copy-and-paste job, which is often submitted by so many others. While going through the process, answer any questions that prospect contractors might ask, as this also demonstrates they've paid particular attention to your drafted requirements and are responding accordingly. Is prepaying scary? One of the most frightening experiences a new outsourcer can encounter occurs when you've just selected a contractor for your exciting new project and he or she asks for 50% up front. This often isn't a significant amount of money, but many contractors will request this to prevent themselves from being taken advantage of. Remember, it's a two-way street. Most Westerners go into outsourcing with a lack of trust or confidence in the loyalty, capability, and ethics of the contractors they are considering engaging. While it's fair to be wary and to take the necessary precautions to ensure you have a good experience, you should remember that it's quite likely that your job may well be the sole source of revenue for your contractor for the following weeks. As a result, he or she is going to, rightly so, take precautions to ensure that as an employer, you have the funds available to pay when required. As a result, there are a couple of key points to consider. It's entirely possible that your contractors will inform you that they have one key model for payments. This could be 50% up front, 50% at completion, 20% up front, and the remainder to be paid at milestones throughout the project, or any other variation. 
When outsourcing web design work, the maximum amount I'd suggest you provide as an upfront payment is 50%. Do this only if you are completely confident in the capability of the contractor and want that contractor specifically to complete the work, based on his or her portfolio, clients, quality of work, and any other varying factors. If the concept of prepaying frightens you, many of the outsourcing platforms offer an escrow service. This means you pay the money at the start of the job to an account managed by the platform, and both parties, you and your contractor, can see the funds are there. When you're comfortable that the work has been delivered, you can either release the total amount or release it in block payments at key project milestones. Using the escrow program and loading it with funds early will instill in your contractor confidence that you have the money and you're willing to part with it. If the contractor sees it there, he or she is more likely to deliver a quick product in order to receive a quick payment. My Basic Pay Scales It actually doesn't make a lot of sense to write out typical pay scales, as these vary greatly depending on what is actually requested and delivered. Regardless, many people have asked for indicative rough figures that I'd expect to pay, so here they are. Web Design When outsourcing design, note, not development, only design, it's typical to request complete delivery of image files only, often in PSD, Photoshop, format. If you have a website developer ready to put the pieces together or want specific design expertise, this can be a fantastic way of building the design foundations of your project. You might expect to spend between $100 and $200 for up to three pages with fairly simple design and minimal artistic creation. Web Design and Development when outsourcing customized web design and development, you would typically approach a freelancer with the intent that they will go through the two-step process of providing designs for approval, followed by the complete technical development phase of the website. The typical delivery for this type of product would be the request that upon completion, the site is delivered, deployed, and live on your hosting package. In this case, you could expect typical cost for a simple, clean, up to 10-page website to be between $200 and $500, subject to the complexity of the development phase. In this case, you are best having all of the website content completed prior to engaging a freelancer. Website Template Configuration as earlier mentioned, if you have purchased your domain name, hosting, and an applicable theme for your desired content management system, you can provide all of these details to a contractor and request that they do the technical work in setting up the final site for you. This will generally take a few hours and will generally cost less than $50, resulting in the full website going live for under $200 and being complete in a day. It's hard to beat that. Copywriting For the purposes of this example, it is assumed that you might be looking for three articles about your chosen niche at around 300 words each to be distributed on a corporate blog. You can typically expect to spend less than $20 to $30 per article. However, this varies greatly based on skill level of the contractor. You should also remember that, ideally, you will be looking for someone here who writes with a strong command of the English language. Proofreading Proofreading can typically be based on a per 1,000 words rate. Remember, you're looking for someone here who is ideally fluent in English. For a highly skilled contractor, you could expect to spend close to $60 for 1,000 words. However, with economies of scale, there is room to negotiate if you are working to a much larger word count. Mobile Application Development Mobile application quoting is always a complex process because there is a huge number of variables at play. As an example, imagine you want to build a native iOS iPhone application that has a few screens and is relatively simple with regards to data flow. 
In this case, you may expect to pay between $1,000 and $3,000, but this is very much based on the work being completed. Note, mobile developers are extremely sought after at present, and as a result, similar work could be valued in excess of $15,000, with the possibility of increasing to around $30,000 or significantly more at a local development agency. As mentioned, these figures and scenarios are only rough indications. Remember, the more information and clarity you have around your project, the simpler the process will be for you. If your brief is simple and transparent, you'll immediately have a pretty good indication of the appropriate price based on your contractor's bids. Another option to encourage as many bids as possible is to select price brackets rather than a specific price. For example, $0 to $500 rather than $260. Price brackets will create an environment where the bidders are able to assess your brief and provide their bids based on what you're requesting from them. If you don't price via this bracket method, you'll find that the bidding will become increasingly competitive, which isn't necessarily a bad thing and you'll encourage low-cost, possibly low-quality contractors to bid who will undercut your quoting price and their competitors in the hope they get through. These are all very much general circumstances, and any number of situations could arise when you create your brief, but in my experience, it's hard to go wrong when providing a clear brief with a broad price bracket. This will encourage the most bids and give you a solid playing field from which to select your dream team. Quick tip. Providing a specific price encourages multiple bidders to make their bids for the same amount. In reality, one of the more popular strategies is to encourage bidders to provide a bid unique to your project as the result of considering your brief in depth. When this occurs, you can select a bidder who may not necessarily be the cheapest, but will provide the most value. Chapter 9. Pulling the Trigger You've written up your pitch and requirements. Now for the exciting part. It's time to choose a contractor. There are many methods for choosing from the bids you receive on your new job, and the single biggest mistake you can make is choosing a contractor based exclusively on price. Another mistake is spending too much time analyzing bids. Research is always your friend, and taking a deep look into each of your bidders is great. But once you get to the point of having filtered down the selection to two bidders from a pool of ten or more, choosing either one of them will generally be fine. Remember, analysis paralysis. One potential differentiator is in the quality of the bid. Though many contractors will attach a range of images demonstrating their quality of work, which is always a nice touch, never rely solely on this. Dive deeper and look at their portfolio and past work ratings on the platform. Though this may be difficult, try to avoid judging the quality of a contractor based purely on their written English skills in the bid. Many of these contractors will know English as a second language, or third, or fourth, and the key point to remember is that as long as they know enough to understand your requirements and are able to collaborate with you, you'll be able to get through the project. More than anything, be able to look past the bid and assess the contractors based on their capability. Be careful of contractors or contracting organizations with a huge number of five-star reviews. While they may just be amazing, I always like to see one or two three- or four-star reviews, as this demonstrates a bit of authenticity. It's very easy to go and register an account and award yourself a job, pay yourself, and give yourself a five-star review. As a result, you really want to dive down and do your research. Always be careful choosing the cheapest bid, while each of the outsourcing platforms, for example Elance, do a great job of monitoring for sketchy behavior from contractors. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is and it pays to be vigilant. 
As has already been mentioned, many people choose to outsource because of the huge low-cost benefits. Don't get too caught up on this. Every contractor you look at will be relatively well-priced, comparatively, and you'll quickly identify that it is very hard to compare purely on price given the volume of bids that are very comparable. If you've shortlisted a couple of ideal contractors based on capability and portfolio, then look at price as a secondary indicator. When I have five ideal contractors with varying price points, I'll rarely choose the cheapest from a price perspective. I'll typically be looking for someone down the middle of the list with the possibility of going up to the higher end. To summarize, always remember to do your research, assess the bid, and look at ratings and portfolios on the platform you're working on. In a contractor's portfolio, you'll probably see a range of jobs completed for clients. Take the time to go onto the client's sites and evaluate the quality of the work. If you're still unsure, you can always actually contact past customers via their websites and ask them about their experiences with the contractor. This is a surefire way of learning exactly how the contractor worked, as you'll get an unbiased view directly from the past customer. To better manage the risk, this is a great strategy to identify whether the contractor is looking to scam you or not. It would be very easy for a scammer to take screenshots of 50 well-designed websites and add them to his or her portfolio. So reaching out to the actual website owners, verifying that the contractor did actually build this site, and asking about the experience isn't a bad move. Remember, these techniques are not foolproof. You need to apply common sense and choose a contractor that works for you. Chapter 10, Managing the Project. Managing the ongoing project is one of the more difficult aspects of outsourcing. The most important part is ongoing communication by communicating as much as possible throughout the entire process to ensure your contractor is on the right path. Project Management The most crucial stage of any project is in the initial delegation of tasks. This is where the contractor can leave with a clear understanding of what needs to take place, or no idea whatsoever. Firstly, you should clearly communicate with your contractor that they do not have a license to waste time. Don't set tasks like, research X and see how you go. This says to them, I don't know how long this should take, have a search around. I've heard horror stories where contractors have spent days researching for a task that could have taken 20 minutes. The trick here is to break up tasks, prioritize them accordingly, and set an hour cap for each. Start with a simple, short, repetitive task to build both your confidence and theirs. Then follow this with short tasks. Another trick is to have your contractor rephrase the task back to you after you've issued it to them. This can happen either in a typed message or verbally, but you'll quickly identify whether they have understood the task at hand. Like with managing any project, a key function is to set up timelines with intended outcomes and very closely monitor progress. By going through that initial project management phase, you'll ensure that both you and your contractor understand all of the required outcomes associated with the project. When considering the milestone setup phase for the best result, you should communicate your desired delivered outcomes along with dates and give your contractor a chance to provide their feedback. This will enable them to communicate outcomes from the very beginning of the project and they'll be aware of the bigger picture. Some outsourcing platforms enable you to build these milestones into the project requirements whereas others will simply require you manage this via the built-in conversational tools. For a basic web design job, your milestones might be Start, Approval of Design, Front-end Development Completion, Integration with CMS Completion, Final Changes, and Final Delivery. This means that throughout the project, you're maintaining close contact with your contractor, and you'll be able to identify when a project might be being derailed early enough to scale up the communication to resolve any issues that may occur. 
Reporting. Another great move is to set up regular reports or meetings. For a long-term project, you might at the very least request a written report to be provided on a weekly basis. If you're very engaged or working with particularly complex project, use these reports in conjunction with a weekly catch-up via Skype or an alternative video calling platform. You'll get the best result when you can see each other and talk through what's working and what still requires thought. This is also great for collaboration early in the project. I'd encourage you to establish a written reporting template that the contractor provides to you daily, weekly, or at any other duration that makes sense given the project timeline. You should be able to communicate with them what they need to keep track of, how frequently they should be in touch with you, and what constitutes an emergency. The idea here is to reduce your administrative burden, not increase it due to constant contact. The trick is to know how much authority you're willing to delegate to your contractor and empower them to make basic decisions and report on these accordingly in order to keep the project moving. In a past website development project that I managed, one of my contractors simply went quiet for two weeks. He mentioned on a number of occasions that he had been sick, which was fine from my perspective, but outlining the importance of weekly meetings or reports may well have set the expectation of regular action taking place. One huge mistake people make when outsourcing is changing or tweaking the project too much throughout the process. It's fine to have new ideas and thoughts on new design or functionality throughout the process, but when you do so, best practice states that you should immediately document exactly, in detail, what should change and how it should change, as well as booking a meeting to discuss the changes and how they might impact other aspects of the project, costs, or timeliness. If you don't hear from your contractor for a few days or you're not happy with the delivery provided throughout the process, it's important to take action immediately. Schedule a meeting and get the project back on track, or you'll continue on a downward spiral. Chapter 11. Close to Completion Finally happy? Are you happy with where your project has ended up? That is, are you really happy? In many cases, you'll get access to unlimited revisions from your contractor, but often the terms state that this is up until the point of final delivery. So before you accept the final project, make sure you've ironed out the creases and you're happy to launch. Managing the delivery. If you've built a website, once again as an example, it's quite possible that the contractor has built this on his or her own server and has shared an obscure link with you in order for you to view the progress of the project to date. Your contractor will likely have configured your CMS, Content Management System, environment, so the first step will be requesting any relevant links or login details for the back end of the website. Alternatively, many of the content management systems on the market have an option to create additional licenses or login credentials. So if your project was to update an existing site, you might well have created a contractor login account to your CMS, which means you'll already have complete access. You'll need to purchase, if you haven't already, your domain name and website hosting package. There are thousands of companies that sell domains and hosting, and almost all are very competitive. Your best bet here is to shop around, review the different hosting options, and select appropriately. Given the amount of competition in this space, you shouldn't be persuaded to spend a significant amount of money on this. As a general rule, don't pay more than $100 for a domain name and an entry-level hosting package per year. Don't get caught up in purchasing too many additional add-ons when purchasing your hosting. Many companies will offer advanced SEO packages or a website builder tool. If these sound of interest to you, try them out. However, many of these are not necessary and are simply a last-minute grab for cash from the respective domain or hosting company. 
Before you buy, understand that your domain name is the address a visitor will type to get to your site. For example, www.mattkellydomainname.com. Think of website hosting as the block of land you purchase on which to build your house. Without the block of land, there is nowhere to put the house. Without a hosting package, there isn't anywhere to store your website. While you're looking at hosting packages, you might consider whether you'd like to get an email address, or multiple, for your new domain name. For example, I might want matt at mattkellydomainname.com and sales at mattkellydomainname.com. If this is the case, ensure your hosting package includes an allowance for multiple email addresses. Many entry-level packages will include one to five email addresses by default. When purchasing your hosting, ensure that the hosting package is capable of integrating with your content management system of choice. In some rare cases, the starter hosting package will require you utilize a proprietary website development tool. If in doubt, call up the company and ask which of its hosting packages best integrates with WordPress or your chosen CMS. If you have a bad customer service experience with this process, move on. There is plenty of competition in the domain name and web hosting space. When you've bought your domain name and hosting package, the best thing to do is forward your confirmation emails, ensuring there are no personal details contained, from the hosting company directly to your developer, and suggest that he or she uploads your new website to this package. Quick tip. An alternative option for email hosting, given many hosting companies charge an added fee for email addresses and often have horrible user interface, is to create a Google Apps account. These start at around $60 each year. For an entry-level website, you can create your Google Apps account, add a small piece of tracking code to your website, your developer can help you with this, and configure your new email addresses in the Google Apps Management tool. The advantage here is that Google provides the entry-level package for a relatively low cost for a limited number of addresses, enabling you to manage your email through the Gmail interface, which many argue is one of the best. Understand that this will not be an at gmail.com address, but they will be at your domain name.com addresses, so from your customer's perspective, there will be no difference here. Leaving feedback. Feedback is essentially currency on many of these outsourcing sites, as having good feedback is akin to having a list of referrals for future jobs. Remember when you were reviewing all of your bids and used their feedback rating and written reviews as one of the influencing factors when selecting a contractor? If you've had a good experience, leave a great review. List what you liked about the contractor and even what you didn't. This will help others select a contractor for their job based on your findings. If you've had a horrible experience with your contractor, it's your responsibility to leave a negative review and list exactly what went wrong to prevent others from making the same mistake you did. Be honest and clear. The contractor may well respond to your comment, so unfair claims on your part will be pointed out. If you create a simple and clear response highlighting where he or she failed to meet your expectations, you'll be assisting others as they select contractors for their projects. Remember, if you've taken the jump, have outsourced a task, and now have the knowledge required to make a more educated decision, it's your responsibility to help others out. A new user who is just starting out may well gain huge value from your review when selecting his or her first contractor. Leaving a review is a simple way of returning the favor and will add value for your fellow co-employers. Chapter 12. Pitfalls and Challenges Payment Scams no doubt when you think about outsourcing, you think about how hard it can be or what's likely to go wrong. 
There are many stories about people getting ripped off, having nothing delivered, or even just having contractors go quiet and no longer be contactable. Honestly, this does happen. In fact, it can happen quite a lot. So you need to consider how you might mitigate these risks early on. When you are defining milestones, communicate that at the completion of each milestone, your contractor will release a portion of the overall payment via escrow. This will enable you to keep the contractor focused while drip-feeding his or her fee over time. This is perhaps the safest option. If the contractor requests a prepayment, it will generally be a minimal fee, for example, 5% in advance. 65% split up over a number of milestones, and 30% at the completion and delivery of the final product. Always remember that the contractor doing the work for you is likely depending on this work to feed his or her family. In the event that you are completely unsatisfied with the quality of work delivered, you might be justified to decline payment to the contractor. If you are refusing payment, ensure you reference the appropriate terms of use when explaining this to the contractor. Another good move is to contact the outsourcing platform and inform them of your situation. If you provided a fair, accurate, and detailed brief, you'll have a reasonably strong case and the contractor will struggle to argue against you. Quick tip. This may not apply to you, but you should always remember that not everyone out there is a nice person. There are plenty of people who will pitch a job and have something delivered with no intention of ever paying for it. While it's against the spirit of outsourcing, you should be aware that if a contractor is skeptical of you, you'll need to demonstrate your trustworthiness and your ability to pay, subject to a completed task. In the event that you don't pay, you should note that each of the outsourcing platforms will have a listed terms of use you've already accepted. If the contractor has a case, he or she may well take action against you. In order to ultimately mitigate the risk of a payment conflict, you might utilize an escrow service, which will hold the money, display the balance to the contractor, and allow you to control when this is released. In this case, you'll have the most control over when the contractor is paid, and they'll have the confidence in knowing that the money is available. Intellectual Property People often express concern about the reliability of using outsourced suppliers. They are worried about their website code or template leaking out or being reused. They are worried about the contractor stealing their idea or doing something new with it. They could even be concerned about their contractor contacting their competition with insider information. Ultimately, if you're so concerned about IP, intellectual property, that it's preventing you from wanting to even start looking at outsourcing, then outsourcing probably isn't for you. If you've got a project that is so top secret and have an idea that the world is desperate to learn about, then let's face it. You need to have a team you can lock in a room and prevent from accessing the outside world. Some people get their contractors to sign non-disclosure and non-compete agreements, but in most cases these won't achieve much, if anything. If contractors want to run out and create their own version of your product, they probably will, and there is generally very little you can do. This isn't all doom and gloom. In truth, once you launch your site, if it's as amazing as you think it is, it is probably going to be copied anyway. No, really, it's going to be copied. There are dodgy people all over the world duplicating websites every day to make a quick buck. As a result, it doesn't pay to get too worried about a contractor stealing your work. Focus instead on getting your best possible product to market as quickly as possible. If you do want to outsource, but need a little more confidence, you can request your contractor sign an agreement that limits what he or she can do with the information you provide. Whether or not it would be worth taking action in the event that something goes wrong is, of course, up to you. Chapter 13. Resources 
outsourcing sites. www.elance.com www.odesk.com www.freelancer.com www.vworker.com www.fancyhands.com www.taskrabbit.com www.getfriday.com www.yourmaninindia.com www.remoteworkmate.com www.fiverr.com Tools that might help Meetings online www.gotomeeting.com www.skype.com Domain name registrars and website hosting www.bluehost.com www.crazydomains.com.au www.hostgator.com www.hover.com www.godaddy.com www.leandomainsearch.com www.rackspace.com Content Management Systems, CMS www.wordpress.org www.magento.com www.joomla.org www.businesscatalyst.com Chapter 14 Bonus How I Got This Far After getting this far, I thought it might be worth letting you know how I got my book and this audiobook to market. First of all, the logo you see on the front cover of my book and this audiobook, and on the website from which you downloaded it, were created via an outsourced contractor. I simply put up a very basic brief and had 17 proposals the next day, ranging from $40 and $250. I selected this particular logo from a contractor based in India. The contractor's hourly rate is $10 per hour. The bid for the total job was $60. The contractor also had a great portfolio, which was hard to pass by. The website that you can purchase my book from, or that you purchased this audiobook from, was created with templates I purchased from www.themeforest.net and www.optimizepress.com. Neither were above $100. While not traditional outsourcing, it's worth a mention that after purchasing my hosting, URL, and the template, I contracted, via Elance, a web system admin for two hours to set up my Google Apps, email, and Google Analytics, install WordPress, and configure a basic home page. Completing this amount of work would have taken me away from work for a whole day, whereas I was able to get the complete job finished by a web expert in just a couple of hours. The final book and audiobook you're listening to now was even proofread and edited by an American author I found on Elance. She was able to read, review, and make recommendations for just over $70, and the audio recording of this book was outsourced to an experienced American voiceover actor for $400. The next step. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. This has been Outsource Your MVP. Written by Matt Kelly. Narrated by Jessica Geffen. <laughs>